Welcome to CAC Live, Tom D. Camillo, Joe Carrera. We are live in the Santan Valley in the beautiful studios that are out here in the desert. Joe, I had to rescue one of your African guineas today. Well, thank you. Did you have to use the helicopter? Uh, no, I had, to, I had to get the uh, ostrich to give him a ride back. Actually, I felt bad. He was trapped <clears throat> outside your fence, and he was going back and forth trying to get to his buddies, and I had to go kind of corral him and bring him back. Yeah. I had to go tell my neighbors, please don't feed my guinea hens because they'll want to live here then. They're like... <laughs> well, why is that bad? They ate the bugs, right? I'm like, exactly. Thanks. <laughs> so, but today, and, and that story's a little science fictional, but it is true. Just a little bit. But today, we're going to talk about science, astronomy, and it's astronomy night at the peak tomorrow night. That's Friday night, beginning at 6 o'clock. We're going to talk more about that, and it is going to be the biggest astronomy night in the history of Central it's Arizona It's not going to be one to miss. I mean, no. it's one that I was considering canceling my Costa Rican trip, but... Since the kids are going to go, my stepson's down from L.A., he's going to take the kids. I'm thrilled. And, and he's going to take some pictures, some videos. I, I really was looking forward to going that, to this one. That will, that's going to be awesome because there are 11 events starting right at 6 o'clock tomorrow night. And we're going to talk about the schedule, talk about what's going on. But we have a couple of special guests in here. Uh, Leslie Wooten from Central Arizona College. Leslie, welcome to the program. We're Thank going to you. talk about your department and, and Keith Eubanks. And Keith has props. So those that are watching, if you look <laughs> behind Keith, that is a real Star Trek communicator. And you have lightsabers, and we're going to talk about those. Uh, they're not the kind that you buy in the Walmart. Do not cut me in half, in. please. <laughs> right. I want to so, stay assembled. Let's so. see how this goes. <laughs> and by the way, uh, our studio audience seemed to be very happy with our guest today. Let, let's give it a hand for our guest today, guys. Hey, hey. So, and if you want to call in and ask questions, Joe's taking calls, 480-745-1033, 480-745-1033. Now, for those of you that don't know, Central Arizona College does an astronomy night at the peak. It's something that started uh, a number of years ago as a public viewing event. Uh, it's exploded into uh, the last time that we had the big one in the fall. We had one two weeks ago, a smaller version. I did have somebody call in yesterday and ask if the chief was going to be there. The chief will not be there this time, but uh, what we'll be talking about, everybody will be talking about, everybody else will be. Uh, what we're going to have, Wild Man Phil will be there, and he will have his animals. Alberto Rios will be there, and he's going to do the poetry of science. Wow. There's going to be items inside and outside. There's going to be uh, most of the buildings are going to have events going on in them. You will probably ha not have enough time to hit everything. We've also changed a little bit. Dara Tompkins did a great job with this. Because we had so many events, everything's going to start on the half hour with a five-minute break. So when you arrive, you'll get a schedule. And you'll be able to plot out the different things that you'll be able to go see. Uh, Katie Wilkins will be back with, obviously, she comes every time with the Star Lab, the Inflatable Planetarium. But the events are just going to be ongoing. If you want to come and have dinner from 5 to 6 o'clock in the cafeteria, if you have kids, it's a buffet. Uh, it's six fifty plus tax. It totals so total it's going to be 7 bucks even for the total. That goes from 5 to 6 o'clock. At 6 o'clock sharp, we are going to start the, uh, the events that are going, to, going on. We expect a big crowd. We expect the biggest crowd ever. The, the big one that we did back in the fall, Joe, had about 400 people that showed up. We expect it bigger than this. But it was so spread out, I walked through that evening, and there was nobody outside. And I thought, where are all the people? Did nobody show tonight? And then when you went inside the building, it was jam-packed. So we're going to have a lot of fun tomorrow night, get there early. And uh, we wanted to welcome both of you. So let's talk a little bit about the Astronomy Night. Leslie, talk about what's going to happen. About What is your role at CAC, and what is going to happen from your area tomorrow night? Okay, well, I'm a professor of English in the communications division, mm -hmm. and the communications division has several really great uh, activities going on. Of course, you mentioned Alberto Rios, who will be with us uh, with his Poetry of Science presentation, and we also have some other activities, the sci-fi memorabilia tours, which Keith Eubanks is going to talk about, but we also have a couple of uh, rooms of activities for the children, for youth, and uh, one of those is the... Um, the story corner or the reading room if you will and so there'll be some ongoing stories being read to children short stories that have to do with science and nature and astronomy and then after the stories are read then they'll be able to the children will be able to um, participate in discussions and have some hands-on activities and then in another room for the the youth we have some well my favorite is uh, the, the children will get to make Mother's Day cards uh, for their mothers in different languages Russian 
Portuguese, Spanish, and French. So that will be kind of neat, and there'll be some language uh, card tricks it, that they can participate in, and also um, opening um, pinata games. Wow! So hey, you know we've got a lot going on. There's there's, there's a lot. It's it's interesting on how dynamic that this astronomy night has become. Uh, Dr. Wayne Pryor um, will be talking about the Big Bang, and and mm -hmm. and that's where this all started from, but. When you look at the different departments that have gotten involved and Keith bringing in his props and, and, and your area, mm -hmm. it really, you can tie a lot of this to science, in whether it's communications, English, math, whatever it is. There's a lot of different ways you tie it to science, which is what education is trying to do, that whole STEM sort of program. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Keith, let's talk a little bit about your role on tomorrow night. And uh, okay. Joe, I think people could see in the background, if you want to switch the camera angle there, um, we have a stormtrooper standing on guard, uh, aiming. I think it's at Joe right now. And uh, there we go. So, and then you will also have a Star Trek communicator. So, why don't you explain a little bit about some of your what your role is at CAC, what's going to happen tomorrow night, and how you got involved, and then we'll talk about your props. Sure. Uh, it it grew um, exponentially, um, kind of like a big bang all by itself. It usually does when <laughs> Diane Beecroft is right. involved, right? It does yeah. grow exponentially. So. You know, it started as a, uh, you know, how can the English department or the communications division contribute? And, you know, I was listening to this and, you know, Science Night, Astronomy. And I thought, you know, I've got uh, I've got these really cool models. They're about three, three feet. They're studio scale models. They're very large. And I thought, well, it'd be kind of cool to just set those up maybe near the telescope and, you know, people can look at them and, you know, think about, you know, how a lot of astronauts, a lot of scientists were actually inspired by shows like Star Trek. Um, they were kids like I was watching it you know, in, the, in the 60s. And, you know, they took that kind of vision and, and made it happen. Um, you know, so it was the inspiration. So, you know, art, you know, motivates us and inspires us. And, and it goes in a lot of different directions, including, you know, science. So, you know, I volunteered to bring a couple props with me, and then it turned into, well, you know, let's put it in a room. And then I thought, well, you know, okay, well, I've got a few <laughs> other things I can bring them in. And, and it began to develop, and then Diane asked me if I could bring them in earlier because we've got some, uh, I think we've got some junior high and high school kids coming in. So it's kind of turned into an all-day show, and that kind of put some pressure to add and add and add to it. So, you know, it's going to be, they're, they're going to be probably 20 uh, different interesting things in there to look at that have to do uh, with with science fiction, and who knows, that may inspire a future scientist, right? <laughs> I know we have a, we just got a caller already. It's probably the record for the quickest mm -hmm. caller. That was quick. <laughs> well, you, you know, you started talking about the props, and Mario from Tucson called and says, do you sell any of the props? I've been looking for stuff for a long time. I'm in video production. <laughs> oh, well, I, I, you know, I do sometimes, but that's, uh, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not selling anything right now. But, but the nice thing uh, is they can go down to astronomy night and see all these props, right? Yeah. And, you know. And get some good ideas on maybe how to put them together. Yeah. Look on, look on the internet, look on eBay, um, you know, and there are plenty of different, uh, you know, groups and organizations that create props and sell them so you know it's they're not that hard to find but i'm telling you if you go down to this astronomy night and see these props these are amazing these are the original lightsabers actually i don't know if you can see or not but he actually demonstrated and i lost a finger <laughs> he actually cut one of my fingers off because i thought it was fake so well, let's uh, it, it's it, it was that mario from tucson is that yes. That's okay. Well, Kate, why don't you bring in bring in one okay. of the lightsabers sure. to explain? Don't turn it on my way, okay? <laughs> right. But since Mario was asking about being in in production, movie production, right? Or video, film, video, video production, production to show, and, and Keith was telling us beforehand. Like I said, these are not the things that you buy like for Christmas for your kid to play around. These are how they were constructed, right? At, at, for the movie, and and, and uh, show people and explain. I'm going to cover what it my is. eyes. You're not. You just don't turn them on, okay? <laughs> All right. Well, All right, thank you. One of the things that we're gonna just show you is give you a little brief demonstration tomorrow night about how these really iconic science fiction props were created and what I have here is a very good um, and relatively expensive replica of Darth Vader's lightsaber from uh, the original film and you know this is machined aluminum it's very heavy you know it's really it's a it's a piece of art it's no, there isn't anything plastic on this um, but what I wanted to show you guys is that what we have here, which you'll notice is extremely similar, this is a camera flash. It's a Highland camera flash, and it's an antique. Uh, you know, they don't make them anymore. In those old black and white films where you see photographers running around holding up the camera like this, the, the thing that they're holding on to is the actual camera flash. And this is a tube for batteries. 
and there would be a dome that would be placed on top of this to direct the flash, and this opening is for the bulb. Uh, all George Lucas did, and you know, Star Wars, you know, was not meant to be, you know, a, a big franchise, you know, series of films. Originally, they weren't sure, you know, where it was going to go. It was kind of a space opera. He took antique flashes, and for hand grips, they basically cut windshield wipers and glued them on and put a little tape over this metal band and that became Darth Vader's lightsaber. And there's a similar story uh, for the Luke Skywalker uh, lightsaber. It's a Graflex. And so for, you know, to go back to Mario's question, if you want to go on eBay and look up Highland or Graflex camera flashes, you, they're very recognizable. I mean, this looks very much just like a lightsaber. Any kid, you know, if you hand it to him and say, oh, it's a, you know, it's a lightsaber. Um, you can get that and you can, you know, get a couple other, you know, pieces to add to that very easily. And you would actually have something that is closer to an actual replica of what they used in Star Wars than, you know, spending, you know, two or $300 on something like this. And, um, you know, these are things that you can do at home and they display really well. Uh, people who collect, uh, you know, antique cameras hate Star Wars because <laughs> all of the Graflex and Highland flashes are being pirated. Uh, and turned into, you know, lightsabers, oh which God. offends them. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, but the prices on these are going up too. So, but, you know, these are, this is just a little, you know, a little history about, you know, art, you know, and prop building, right? I think you answered the question here, Teresa from Coolidge Hatch. Is, is that the original, actual Vader <laughs> saber? <laughs> That's a great, and no, that is not. Um, it, the, it, George Lucas has that. Uh, he, in <laughs> fact, uh, you know, is very proprietary about Star Wars and Indiana Jones props. Um, but these are, you know, these are made, actually, these were made by a company that doesn't exist anymore, and they are made by actual Hollywood prop builders. Um, this one was Master Replicas, uh, if you want to look it up. Uh, they, you know, it was just too expensive, you know, to make these and make a prof profit off of it so that the company didn't live, you know, as long as I wish it would have. But uh, these are rare, though, and they are very hard to come by, and they're as close as you can get. I mean, they are so they were made virtually the way, identical. They were made the way George Lucas had them made for the film. As well, no, you know, they, mm -hmm. because people, you know, think this doesn't feel right, you know, it doesn't, you know, and so they actually made them feel like we want them to feel, which is it's got some, you know, heft, heft. to it, and they're heavier, and they're, they're solid metal. Um, but, you know, that's the truth about, you know, props, Tom, is that when you look at them, and I've seen some of the original props, for instance, from Star Trek, and they're junk. Um, you know, they, they're abused. They're made out of wood or very cheap resin. Um, you know, they're not painted well, but they only had to show well on television, which was low resolution, and it was on a small screen. And so the, the, it's an illusion. You know, that's a wonderful thing about the art of props is that when you get too close – it doesn't look so good anymore and it's not <laughs> worth a lot of money. You know, I mean, actually these are better, <laughs> you know, as far as displaying <laughs> them though. Um, you know, they're made on the cheap. Can you bring, um, the Luke, Sky is it the Luke Skywalker one that has the grenade? Uh, I'll show you the, yeah, it's Obi-Wan yeah. Kenobi. Yeah. Or Obi-Wan yeah. Kenobi. Yeah. This is, uh, this is really cool. And he's going to explain the different parts to this one. But as you look at it, you can see, explain what that center part is there. Well, I'll give you a rundown uh. and we're going to show this tomorrow night. The, the beauty of this, and this is really uh, speaks to you know, the artistry, it's a work of art. Um, for Obi-Wan's lightsaber, they really just took a pile of junk and the artist figured out how we could piece these things together and create something, right? That would become you know, one of the most iconic you know, symbols, right? Uh, you know, at least in modern science fiction. The Obi-Wan Kenobi lightsaber, the, the pommel or the end is actually a sink knob, okay? The next piece here, is a gear it's a piece of a gear from machinery this center piece is part of a camera flash it's the band and the on off switch for the graflex um, camera flash mm -hmm. this piece though this is an mk1 british grenade um, <laughs> that's and, awesome yeah i mean a dummy grenade if he doesn't win the fight <laughs> right <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then there's uh, just a kind of a flange attachment here and something that looks like it came off of some kind of a bunsen burner and this and this piece, even from the prop geeks out there, has never been fully identified. They're not exactly sure what this piece came off of. But, you know, we do know that it obviously, you know, had some kind of flame. And so, you know, you've got, what, five or six unique pieces of scrap junk uh, when, you know, put together, you know, turns into, uh, you know, a, a really interesting piece of art, you know, an interesting piece of memorabilia. And, uh, by the way, the, the little clear buttons here 
on the on and off switch. These were from a uh, uh, an old calculator, one of the first calculators that were ever made. And if you were to pull the numbers up off the calculator, the, this piece of plastic is here, and this is what the connectors were uh, when you punch in the numbers. And so they just trimmed that and cut it and glued it on there. Does it light up that? No, no, no. These don't. These are just these are static props. They're really meant for you to kind of ooh and all over them, and you know you can. can, I, can, you I can see hold, that? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. It's funny. It's pretty heavy too. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny because uh, Jerry Deal, who oversees the theater at CC would keep all this and it looks like junk but wow. when he's building props for theater right that's why he keeps all this stuff around yeah. so said that he can instead of having to go out and buy it but i guess the creativity i mean that's that's amazing you took a bunch of junk and put it together and it's yeah. an iconic piece of american film well you know here's the point tom you know one of the things that you know we always get gets cut is you know uh, money for art education mm -hmm. And then we complain because our movies are all recycled, right? They're either remakes of old movies or they're sequels of movies that we've already seen or we think they're really badly written. Um, and But we're not funding, right, art. And we keep cutting back. And I think that, you know, we're hurting ourselves uh, culturally, you know, by, by doing that. And so, you know, these these little things, you know, they're, they're, they're fun and they appeal to a certain, you know, kind of person, but they speak, I think, to a bigger, you know, bigger picture. Um, so, you know, that's kind of part of my, you know, passion for it, actually. How, how did you get involved in collecting all of this stuff? <laughs> uh, when I was a kid, I got an Aurora uh, model kit of the USS Enterprise, which I tried to build and paint, and it looked horrible. <laughs> uh, and I'm not a modeler, right? I'm just, I'm not yeah. an artist. And I, you know, grew up watching that show. Uh, I don't know. I've just got a sentimental, you know, connection to it. And I always wanted to have a really cool model of the Enterprise. And then one day, um, a company came out with the ultimate, you know, version. It's actually a studio scale, three foot. It's one of the smaller models that they would use. The original Enterprise, you know, is in the Smithsonian Institute, and it's very large. Uh, but this was a three foot model, and you know what? I kicked down, and you know, my wife <laughs> had a fit, but I kicked <laughs> down, you know, for that ship, and and then um, it, I got the bug. You know, I got I got the bug, and there are certain things that I kind of have a. I don't know, a connection to, you know, and so I kind of hunt those down. And then, you know, I like the game of finding them, you know, looking for them. It's uh, You're listening to CAC Live, Tom DiCamillo, Joe Carrero. We're talking with Keith Eubanks and Leslie Wooten about the Astronomy Night at the Peak and their roles. 480-745-1033, uh, 480-745-1033. Um, Keith, when you are when you look at how the, the, the film industry... <laughs> There you go. I was trying to do a good Star Wars <laughs> thing here for you. I like I'm partial to Vader's theme. That's the one, huh? <laughs> the when you talk about the um, the impact that the science fiction film has had on on culture, on education, it really has. I yeah. mean, when you look at uh, you know everything from. If I recall correctly, when they did the first space shuttle, it wasn't the one that went into space. It was kind of the dummy, big, and it was yep. named Enterprise. Enterprise yeah. And it rolls it out, and they had the cast that's from that. Right. Yeah. And so how come that's take? How how come it's had such an impact on all the different aspects of our life? Well, because we didn't have any of those things, you know. I mean, guys, I think you know our age. You know, we grew up before there were computers, before there were laptops, before there were cell phones. And the world, you know, that we grew up in was very different, and we really felt the impact of this, you know, surge, you know, in technology. And I think part of that came, you know, it was inspired. You know, we've, since the beginning, been looking at the moon and looking at the stars and wondering how to get there. And, you know, when you see somebody land a robotic... Um, uh, you know craft on Mars and start taking samples and you see the guys in the control room cheering you know that we're celebrating centuries of dreams you know that that really you know kind of inspired us to to reach out you know and and to ask the big questions about you know who are we where you know where do we fit in all of this um, is there more to it you know um, what's our role right not just you know in, in terms of globally but in the universe and you know that's we, we've always kind of thought that way so I think that you know, naming the shuttle Enterprise, you know, it was it was a big deal, you know, because it speaks to the impact that a show like Star Trek had on the culture and to the inspiration, you know, of guys like Captain Kirk to the future astronauts and the people that, you know, commanded those shuttles. There was a uh, tweet recently from the last mission uh, of the Endeavor. Uh, it was in orbit and the shuttle commander was tweeting, right? And he got a response from William Shatner, who plays Captain Kirk in Star <laughs> Trek, and he said, are you tweeting from outer space? 
And the commander of the shuttle responded, standard orbit, Captain, all systems are normal. You know, I mean, and it's, it's sweet, you know, but it speaks to the idea that, yeah, he, he knows it. He's aware of it. We're all aware of it. And it's, you know, it's inspired us. Um, before the show, we were talking about the, the communicator. Uh, you know, the, the guys on Star Trek would flip their communicator open and be able to talk to the ship or talk to somebody on the other side of the planet. And, you know, I remember as a kid thinking, wow, wouldn't that be really cool? Well, you know, we do that now. You know, the geeks that were inspired by Star Trek are the geeks that are building your iPhone, you know, or your iPad or your flat screen TV. So there's a there's a connection between, you know, sci-fi geeks and science geeks, you know. And so and, and part of it's the inspiration. I brought a communicator. Actually. Why don't you bring that over there? Because it's funny. It's I'll let you guys it, play er, with it. the early cell phones or even any kind of flip phone that you had. Right. As Star Trek kind of went along. Right. It looks like some of them. Yeah. And, you know, we would flip them open and talk. You know, Captain Kirk would. Yeah. So that's cool. Flip it open. <laughs> right. And, you know, Kirk to Enterprise. Right. And uh, but it's a flip phone. And the design, you know, I'm sure was inspired, you know, by, you know, somebody who was looking at this thinking, you know, one day we're going to have this. So, you know, the world is different. You know, comp- computers used to take up great amounts of space, vast amounts of space in large buildings. You know, they're big columns of, of these things. And today your MacBook Pro uh, will blow the, anything that they had, you know, way back then. But it was it was science fiction. So I guess what was science fiction when I was a kid is reality today. So, you know, what's going to be interesting to see is what is it that science fiction today that will be reality, you know, in the next generation. Right. They used to show us, and I can remember being in elementary school and then in middle school, and they would show um, what it's going to be like in 1995. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, and flying cars and yeah. different things, and and the world doesn't look that much different, but the technology is so different in some some respects, way beyond what they told us it would be. Yeah. And it's it's funny when I when I watch, I always I I tell my wife I said when you watch history shows, right, mm-hmm. and I, and I'll compare this to science fiction. Uh, when you watch history shows, everything in the United States, like pre-1900, is like in color. And that period from like 1900, when film came along and video, and all the way till like the 50s, is black and white. And when you view things at that time period, the early part of the 19th century, or early part of the 20th century, in sort of black and white. And you look at science fiction, it's almost like we watch so much of it, the Star Treks, the Star Wars, oh, It'll be so easy for us. We can go to the moon. We can just get on. Sh- this is what we're going right. to do. And it takes them forever to do a Mars rover yeah. just to get there. Yeah. And, and, and sort of the reality. But it seems like the science fiction has helped spur sort of the, 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 that striving to get there. I think what it does is it, it, it gives us a, a sense of the ideal. Right. I mean, what is it? It's a good way to put it. What would we like to do? I mean, what would be the ideal? Um, to, to travel at the speed of light. Well, we may, we may get there or to be able to break something down in a molecular level and, and recreate it somewhere else. Well, people are actually working on that. They're working on, you know, antimatter propulsion systems for space, because if we're going to go anywhere further than Mars, we're going to have to have, you know, an, another, another way to do it. You know, we can't do it on rocket fuel, um, but they're working on it. So, you know, I think science fiction kind of, you know, gives us a visual image of what the ideal might be. And then it's interesting to see you know where and i think the joy comes from seeing where you know how close we get to the ideal you know eventually and it's funny because when you look at what will be interesting as we move forward especially with the language components is how much of as we bring this new technology that we name it after things that were named right. in the shows i mean how many of us when the first time that man is if it if it ever is able to beam up somewhere, right. what are we going to call it? Well, we're going to call it what they called it in Star Trek. Yeah, we're going to use that terminal. <laughs> it'll be a transporter. Yeah. Will, mm-hmm. will you, and that's kind of really, uh, it's interesting that the language could go in that direction. Right. Yeah. So you're listening to CAC Live. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to talk more with Keith Eubanks, and we're going to visit with Alberto Rios and talk about the poetry of science. You're listening to CAC Live on KQCK in the Santan Valley. 
Are you experiencing computer problems? Is your computer running slow, bogged down with viruses and spyware? You need a reliable and knowledgeable, trustworthy computer service company. Contact Computers, Networks, and More, located in Santan Valley. Get your computer or laptop running in top condition by a certified technician with 20-plus years' experience and beta tester from Microsoft. Computers, Networks, and More provides repairs and solutions to any computer-related issue, whether it's software, installation, troubleshooting, updates, or tune-ups. You can trust Computers, Networks, and More. Contact Jeff Monday through Saturday, 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. to schedule an appointment. We can have you up and running quickly, usually within 48 hours. Located in Santan Valley, Computers, Networks, and more. We're here for you. Contact Jeff at 480-729-8899. That's 480-729-8899. Our family pets are such a big part of our lives. That's why Kelly's Critter Clips of Queen Creek and Sun Lakes has been providing pet grooming services for over 10 years. Your dog's comfort is very important to us. So we take the time to treat your pet with care, love, and professional attention it deserves. We welcome any size and breed and feature shampoo and conditioning, styling, flea and tick dips, ear cleaning, nail trimming, and so many other services that will leave your pet looking good and smelling good and feeling great, all at an affordable price. Located in Queen Creek and Sun Lakes, call now for an appointment, 480-655-5066. Kelly's Critter Clips. When you visit Hill Family Dentistry in Santan Valley, Dentist Dr. Tim Hill provides each patient with personalized, gentle care that you deserve. Our entire team is dedicated to providing you and you and your family with services that will make you smile. With a full range of general, cosmetic, and specialty dentistry services that will keep you and your family smiling. Our commitment to our community is to provide outstanding oral health. Hill Family Dentistry is located on 36359 Gansell Road in Santan Valley, diagonally across from Banner Ironwood Hospital. Evening and weekend appointments available. We accept most insurances and have in-office policies available for non-insured. Contact us today at 480-588-8127. Hill Family Dentistry. Welcome back to CAC Live. Tom DiCamillo, Joe Carrera. We are live in the Santan Valley studios. We're talking about Astronomy Night at the Peak. Visiting with uh, Keith Eubanks and talking about uh, tomorrow night. Keith is going to bring as part of the program. How many props are you bringing? There'll be, I don't know, 15 to 20 wow. different, different things there. There'll be four uh, or five ships that are all, you know, large. I mean, three feet is large for a model, um, you know. Um, some 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 things from classic science fiction, Day the Earth Stood Still, some old you know TV shows like Space 1999, Lost in Space. There'll be a replica of the Jupiter 2 there from that show, and it's it's lit up. It's got effects and things, so it'll be kind of fun to look at. And when you talk about the Day the Earth Stood Still, you're talking about the original one that was made back yeah. in the, back oh, yeah. in the, It's one of my father's favorite movies. Yeah. Yeah. When we were and kids, the, one of the first ones he showed us. Yeah, and we're going to have the uh, alien ship from War of the Worlds. Uh, nice. Also, yeah, that's so cool. Some cool nods, you know, to uh, you know some other things from some really old sci-fi movies like Metropolis, um, which a lot of people you know don't know a lot about. But it was a sci- silent science fiction film. So I mean, from the get-go, we were making sci-fi yeah. movies, right? Uh, and it's about a guy who makes a robot that he turns into a, a real woman. But the robot's name is Maria, and she's all metal. And she was actually the prototype or the inspiration for C-3PO in Star Wars. And Lucas really? is a film nut, you know, and he. It was a homage. C three PO is actually a homage to you know Metropolis. Wow, that's yeah. uh, I I grew up watching um, the original Flash Gordon yeah. with Buster Crab on yeah. Sunday mornings. Mm-hmm. That's my father introduced that to my right. brother and I. And every Sunday, you know, it was a one of the serials. Yeah, yeah, you know, and that's what he grew up going to the theater and watching. Yeah. So, um, and then now Leslie, I know we have on us Alberto Rios is joining us from Arizona State University. He's going to. Uh, talk about what uh, the poetry is science and Leslie before we bring Alberto on how did this connection happen and what will Alberto be uh, actually talking about or or how will the program work with him well he's going to be uh, speaking from 630 to 715 in uh, T116 at uh, on campus and uh, he has written a great deal of poetry and much of his poetry has to do with um, you know, other worlds, other planets, other st- the stars. And uh, so 
uh, he also is, you know, magical realism is one of his um, literary realms. And in fact, that's how I came to know Alberto Rios in the mid-90s. The very first creative writing class that I ever took was his magical realism class. And it literally changed my life. Uh, probably because I had never written any kind of magical realism before, nor even really read very much of it. But he opened that door, that window for me, and I realized that, you know, I could walk down paths that I had never walked before. And he, you know, helped me and all of us in the class to realize that. So, I don't know. I mean, I'm going to let him speak for himself, really. But uh, Alberto, welcome to CAC Live. You heard the... Uh, the the glowing review of your class from Leslie, can, can you t ex talk a little bit about what you'll be you know your program tomorrow night? I know you're excited about coming down to CAC and this whole event that yeah. we're going to be doing. What what will people that come to see you? What, what are they going to get from uh, your poetry? Well, I appreciate you having me on. Uh, I I love talking about uh, things like uh, science, the stars, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, Leslie mentioned magical realism. I, I, I think of it, our lives. We have so much, and I, I know you're having science fiction as part of the event uh, tomorrow night as well. Uh, the science fiction that's right in front of us every day is, is, is striking to me. And what I'm going to be talking about is trying to combine some sense of what, what science does out there in the universe. Science, after all, is a search for meaning. And, and literature is, is also a search for meaning. We do it in different ways. I think science works with numbers, and, and literature works with language. When I talk, I try to combine those two things to make sense uh, uh, of what those numbers mean and, and how do we live uh, with that knowledge in our lives. Do you so I'll be talking about humanizing what science uh, maybe uh, puts too quickly in front of us so that we don't always take it in. When, when people... I always said that when when I look at science fiction shows or novels, it's it's the stories that carry them, and the science fiction mm -hmm. is the backdrop, and that's the interest. When it, the science fiction overplays the story, people get disinterested. Would you would you agree with that or disagree with yeah, that? No, I would agree with it. I would agree with it absolutely. And and here's where science sort of uh, has fallen down. In in that, for example, I can tell you I can tell you how to type, and you will understand me. But that doesn't mean you can go home and type. You've got to live <laughs> that experience. Yeah. So just plain information, which is what science so often gives to us, D doesn't embody the story you have to bring along with it and that it should carry with it as well. Do, do you think that, that because science fact and science fiction, are, they're so captivating a, a, in, in the subject matter that that inspires people to want to write is that a good way to get people to write because when you're in like a, when you're in school elementary school or high school yeah. or middle school a teacher says I want you to write a paper on something like this you might be in an English class and the subject right. matter is maybe less than interesting but when they open up <laughs> the science fiction part and say write something like that do you kind of see the interest that their eyes get bigger and now that oh, entices oh. them to write more you know hundred percent I mean when you take when you take the limits off and uh, science so often fa makes us uh, uh, have to work with limits. Science fiction does almost the opposite. There are no limits. And, and I think people just feel like they're suddenly racing across a great green field. I mean, it, it's just fun. And uh, I, I think that's where a lot of discoveries get made, is when you can put the limitations to the side for the moment. You can't always do it. But when you try that long, fast, hard run that we all know from childhood, it is, is so great. It's like getting out of school, and school is science. <laughs> the playground is, is invention, and, and to spend some time out there is, I think, critical. I think that's what these courses do, this kind of literature does. I, uh, talk a little bit about, and what was the term Leslie used? Magical? Magical realism. Explain what that Magical is. Realism. Explain what that is for the listeners um, and how you incorporate that into your classes. Well, ma magical realism is really science fiction in daily life, <laughs> literally. Mm -hmm. But it, it's, a, it's a term uh, uh, that often refers to Latin American literature, which is uh, one of my specialties and, and uh, uh, a work I'm very interested in and, and what I write. But, you know, we, we get hung up on that word magical, but it's really just defining realism. It's saying that realism, some really strange things happen in a given day. <laughs> and that, that's, that's essentially what it, what it uh, works with. 
It's give us a little bit more about your background, how you ended up at ASU, and how you got involved in in this career. For those that are listening that maybe don't know much about your background, well, I grew up in Nogales, and uh, I my mother, uh, my father was born in uh, southern Mexico, and my mother was born in England. And uh, growing up on the border, I had I had multiple sensibilities always mm-hmm. around me that helped to make me think of myself. In, in, in many different ways. I had different languages, different foods, uh, different everything. And so there wasn't any single thing that had only one way to be looked at, so that a pencil was also a lapis and was also whatever else it was. It gave me perspective, and I, I think that helped to turn me into a writer. Uh, I went to U of A. I, uh, at, the, at the time, Nogales was maybe not what you would call a college preparatory experience. <laughs> so I didn't know how to go to college, really, but I did know how to go to 13th grade. And I think that's how I entered uh, into the you know, university setting. I just it, it suddenly was like science fiction to me. It opened up everything. And, and that was magical realism for me. It was just realism. It was just there. But from my perspective, it was magical. So I, I took coursework and, and eventually uh, became a writer and, and had some some good success early on and and got a call from ASU uh, saying, hey, you want to come over here and work? And (laughs) I don't think that's legal anymore, but it was a wonderful (laughs) way to to, uh, to, uh, get on, uh, uh, you know, someplace. And I've never looked back. I've been at ASU for for over 31 years now. Wow. And and in fact, I did some early work before I came to ASU at CAC. Really? I had a writer in, I was a Canal County writer in residence, which is something something uh, we invented. I, I tried to use, I, I knew that, that uh, people couldn't always come to a classroom, especially in a, an agrarian large county like Pinal County. But it, 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 and it struck me that uh, how, how does the landscape work? How do people go about their daily business? And there were all sorts of models out there like the agricultural extension agent. You couldn't bring, if you had something on your farm that was going wrong, you didn't bring your farm into the shop. <laughs> <laughs> the agent goes out to the farm, and it, it hit me like a ton of bricks that maybe there's a place in education and for teachers to, to do something similar to that. So I went out all over the county helping people who wanted to uh, work on writing. And uh, I went up and down, left and right, and, and uh, had a really a wonderful time. It's funny that you say that when you look back 30, 35, 40 years ago describing Pinnell County, and that today... That that connection of of what CAC does and what a lot of you know businesses and education do today in Pinal County is the science fiction of thirty and forty years ago is now the science fact that is able to bring that education throughout a county that's so rural like like Pinal. That's right. It's now called the internet. <laughs> yes, or the flip <laughs> phone. Of, the the Star well, Trek flip phone. Imagining what the internet was mm-hmm. going to do, you know. But back then you had to make you had to drive the miles. It's it's and it's it really is it opens up a lot of opportunities. Do you think that the way the science technology has gone with internets and cell phones and and long distance education through like an ITV and those kind of things, uh, do you think that has opened the doors for people that are creative in writing, creative in in dreaming, creative in science fiction and science fact that maybe would have never got an opportunity had that technology not existed now? Well, I, I think it gives us, you know, what, you know what I love about that question is I don't know the answer. And, and what I mean by that is it means anything is possible. And, and I think those lim- limits that used to be there even, even 30 years ago are erased. And so people who are creative, people who are, are doing all sorts of things, there's a place for them now. It's not, a, you know, creativity which might have once isolated you. Now, now you, you have the world to join into. And, and I think that's pretty exciting. When people come to see you tomorrow night at Central Arizona College and you do your presentation, what what are you trying to convey to them? And what can, what do they get out of it? Yeah, I, I, I think the one word is possibility. And that uh, whatever all of those big things are that are out there, the study of science, uh, the study of poetry, the whatever, I, I want to bring them to a humanizing level and, and just have a good kitchen table conversation with people. And, and I think that's what I do best in my work. The, the way I write and the things I talk about, 
I think it brings us all together. It's not about alienating anybody. It's about bringing us all into some moment of understanding that I, I hope when people leave, they'll be changed by it. When, when In your writing, as you kind of look back over your career, w- there's a lot of different writings, and, and you know I've written for a long time, and, and I've done a lot of sports writing. And uh-huh. I always look back as, what's, what is my favorite thing to write about? And my favorite thing to write about is about my Italian family. Even though I spent most of my career writing about yep. sports or PR, what do you enjoy <laughs> writing about? I mean, you've written a myriad of things, but what subject yep. is that it comes easy for you? Well, I, I think it's adolescence because that, that's when everything, you know, physically was changing and it, it made me think wild thoughts. And I think, whoa, that's, that's what I want to write about. <laughs> the, the, uh, there, there's a wonderful uh, quotation. Uh, by Jacques Prévert, he was a French writer, who says, it is spring, the needle goes wild in the compass. And I love that. Where is north when you're an adolescent? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> and and I, I think it's that moment where where everything kind of hits you like a ton of bricks in a, in a, in a good way, uh, sometimes a dangerous way, obviously, but I, I think something in that mix uh, is what I like writing about because it's all about possibility. I think that compass turns north at that age any way you turn is, <laughs> is, is how it goes. That's exactly right. <laughs> so, Alberto, we look forward to having you down at the Signal P campus tomorrow evening. Uh, and and uh, Alberto's going to go on at 6.30, and it's going to go till 7.15. Yes. Okay. So if fans, if, if uh, participants, guests, visitors, fans want to do that, you want to make sure T116 is sort of our mini – um, uh, I call it the very mini um, Penn Center. It holds about 120, 130 people in it, but it's it's uh, theater style seating. It's a very relaxed atmosphere, and uh, it's in the T building, which is at one end of where all the events will will be going, and then it will spread out across the campus. Alberto, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow night. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much. Alberto Rios will joining us tomorrow night for the Poetry of Science. You're listening to CAC Live on KQCK. And, Keith, we were talking before the break and before Alberto a little bit about um, a class that you teach tied to science fiction. Talk about that. Yeah. Um, I wrote a, some curriculum for the college. It's a class on science fiction, literature, and film. And I'm teaching that right now uh, for the college. It's turned out, you know, uh, thankfully, thanks to the students, it's a popular course. It, it always fills. Um, it's a 200 level, uh, you know, intensive writing course. But uh, the theme, you know, is science fiction, a different kind of science fiction than Star Wars and Star Trek. It's about um, the darker possibilities of the future. It's about the ideas of uh, the utopia and how in science fiction they tend to always turn into dystopias. The, the perfect world in science fiction is always a place that people are trying to get out of. Um, and, <laughs> and, and there's a reason for that. Uh, so the, the course has a, uh, a, a basis in, in philosophy. Um, the students are reading. And this is a good example of, of how, you know, uh, you know, we're not just talking about a fragmented genre here. We're talking about something a little bit broader. Um, everything began as philosophy. Over time, education began to split itself up into disciplines. But, you know, in, in the beginning, when you really go back, and, and I have a degree in philosophy also, you, you see that there was a philosophy of, you know, astronomy of, of medicine um, and you had philosophers trying to you know without tools uh, without empiricism right in, in, without the empirical method trying to make you know uh, sense right of the physical world and you know so this class goes back to that kind of idea they, they read Plato they read Foucault they read Nietzsche um, and then we look at things like you know Orwell um, we look at you know Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451 we look at uh, and we use Blade Runner um, and the original novel that Philip K. Dick wrote, which was Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, a 1960s, <laughs> a quirky 1960s novel. It's, uh, it's interesting, uh, an interesting class, and you say it fills all the time. What do the, what do the students say about it? What do you, obviously, if it fills all the time, you're getting a lot of positive feedback. But, right. but what are they getting out of it? And, and do they, when they come in, is it different? By the time it ends the class, of what their expectation was? Yeah, it is. Um, a couple things. They the, first of all, when they come in and I have them reading Plato, you know, the first thing is, where's the science fiction? You know? <laughs> um, or you know, why aren't we in space? You know, what do you mean? You know, that we're never going to leave the planet? And um, and I, I explain to them that in order 
in order to understand the the social commentary and that's really what science fiction is and I think that's what brought me into it was first the literature uh, is that it was really commenting on the world as it is now much less about you know the future that we, we really intended to see and think about where we are where we're going what we're doing should we be doing the things that we're doing you know what is the philosophy you know behind what we're doing and it questions those things and so you know you've got to kind of get a sense of the, the the philosophy to fully understand I think and to really fully appreciate you know what somebody like Ray Bradbury you know was talking about or what Philip K. Dick was talking about and you know one of the things that I like to say in class is that you know education alters perception um, you can you, you can be you know very intelligent person and, and, and not have a formal education and there's certainly you know a lot that, that you can learn and do that in that direction um, when you apply some you know scholarship to something uh, we begin to see a little bit more deeply we begin to see other other layers you know uh, you know to to the to the literature and so I, I bring those in intentionally because I want them to have an aha moment you know and and a lot of my students have read Fahrenheit 451, for instance, in, in you know, elementary school or, or junior high. And I love it when they do that because I tell them, y you haven't read it with me. We're going to read it again, <laughs> and it's going to be a different, it's going to yeah. look like a much different, you know, novel. So, um, yeah, it's the, what they say about it is, you know, one of the things that always is gratifying about that class is that they're all there at the end. Um, you know, we lose people, you know, over the course of the semester, but, you know, I'll start that class with 25 people and there'll be 23 or 24 people in it at the end. So, you know, th there's no attrition, you know, they're, they're sticking around, you know, for a reason. And it's a very demanding class. So, you know, you can take something like science fiction uh, and you can make a very demanding, you know, intensive class out of that and people will stay. You know, they'll stay into the end. They'll write the papers. They'll do the work, you know, um, but you got to find a way to you know, engage them, inspire them. And that's, that's why, you know, I created that class. When, uh, when you look at life and you look at science fiction, and there are times when we take things as science fiction and suddenly it becomes science fact. Right. It's a reality. Is, is that a scary moment for the human race? Whether it's a positive or a negative thing, is that, is that like, it's like, oh, wait, we always thought that wasn't real. Now it's real. Yeah, right. I mean, it's got to be partly gratifying, and then it's got to be partly you have to like kind of cringe. Uh, you know, uh, you know, you you've let a genie out of a box. It's like, wow, we really can do that. You know, well, you know, what else can we do? And then we're suddenly. I mean, I think the question is, were we prepared for it? I mean, that's are probably we, the best you know, question. Yeah. Is and, and uh, often you're not. Yeah, I, and and you know, we we unleash you know these unintentional experiments on our culture and our society and on our world, and we do them because we can. Um, not knowing, you know, where they're going to go or where they're going to end. You know, I mean, just even right now, if you look at what's happening in the world, you know, we've got North Korea making threats about, you know, nuclear weapons. You know, we let that genie out of the bottle and you can't put it back. So how are we, you know, uh, as, a, as a world um, or a global society going to be able to deal with this problem? We still haven't figured it out. I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, off, off off the air. We were talking about you had an opportunity with a very famous filmmaker to do something that not many people get to do. Talk about that because it's really interesting. Yeah, I got to I got to talk to Ridley Scott, uh, who uh, his first film was the original Alien film. But you know he uh, you know did Thelma and Louise, Black Hawk Down. Uh, he won an Academy Award for Gladiator with Russell Crowe. That's a great movie, right? Yeah. And he revisited the Alien you know universe with Prometheus you know last year. Um, but uh, he also, the, the cult, I think, classic film that he, he may end, end up being remembered for is Blade Runner, um, which was the film version of Philip K. Dick's novel. And through, you know, collecting props, actually, um, I got an email from someone saying, hey, this is something you might be interested in. And uh, it was a screening of Blade Runner when they re-released it on Blu-ray and recut the film. Ridley Scott finally got to make the movie he really wanted it to be. And uh, it, was a, it was a charity event. And uh, it was being held at Warner Brothers Studios. So I, I went, I got to go, and I flew out there for a day. And it was really cool to drive onto the Warner Brothers lot, you know, <laughs> like, you know, the celebrities do. Was, you know, you check in with security. And they took me to a theater that they have, which is r basically on the set where they film Blade Runner on the street that they call New York. Um, and uh, I got to watch the film. And then there was a QA and a uh, afterwards with basically everyone who made it from the effects, the producers, the writers, 
uh, Hampton Fancher was there, David Peoples was there, uh, and it was uh, and Ridley uh, was there, and uh, I got to ask basically everything I ever wanted to you know ask about uh, Blade Runner. And um, I met the man face to face, and you know, shook his hand, and forgot to get his autograph. <laughs> <laughs> Were any of the actors there, like Harrison Ford, Rutger Hauer? I think was Daryl Hannah in that. Yeah, Daryl Hannah was in that. R- Rutger Hauer was going to be there, and he actually sent a video message because something he was filming ran long. But he w- he was going to be their surprise guest, so he sent a very nice. Um, um, you know, message along. Um, but uh, yeah, the uh, the actress Joanna Cassidy, who plays Zora, one of the replicants, was was there, and also an actress who um, whose part was cut uh, from the script because of the writer strike. Uh, there was a big writer strike going on at the time, and there was going to be another storyline in the film, and they had cast the actress, and you know, and then it fell apart, and they had to you know make some last minute changes so they could keep filming without you know the writers, and uh, her part was cut, but she was there because she knew a great deal about the history of the making of the film, which was problematic from the very beginning. Um, it's one of the a lot of people that, that worked on that film call it the worst experience they've ever had. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Why? And, why? Just because uh, it was just tough to make? It was filmed entirely at night uh, on Warner <laughs> Brothers lot. It went uh, over budget. Um, it went. The shooting schedule went long. Um, Ridley Scott brought in a British crew, um, which was having trouble working with the American Union crew, and they thought that he was kind of a dictator uh, on the set. And then by the end, he lost control of the film, um, and then took a camera and went on filming anyway, and got a copy of it and started cutting the movie anyway, and uh, did it. You know, did you know, did his own thing. But it was a really um, people who you know, uh, as Hampton Fancher said, people who worked in film said. I don't want to work in movies anymore um, after they finish that movie. But, you know, I think that that's part of the genius of it. Anytime you kind of get that kind of conflict, you know, um, you get those creative differences. Something amazing frequently comes out of it. And this one has, you know, stood the test of time. I, I remember being, what, what year was it re- released originally? Was it 85? I think it was, um, I think it was like 81 or 82, okay. actually. Um, I remember seeing it okay. in the film, in the, in the theater. Okay, so, yeah, because I remember seeing it, and, yeah, that would be right, because I was in high school when I yeah. saw it, and I remember it being, you said it was filmed mostly at night. It right. seemed to be wet all the time yes. in that, in that, and um, I went back and I watched it. It was back on, and I realized at high school, I didn't get it. Yeah, I didn't You know, it. and I got it now, but yeah. I didn't get it then, and uh, I remember liking it, but... Yeah. Yeah. I remember sitting in the theater thinking, this is an important film. And I had never thought that way about a, a movie before. And I went back and watched it four or five times, um, you know, because there was just so much going on. The great thing about Blade Runner, though, is that it's a handmade movie. Um, it's Everything is constructed. It's all real. Um, there's no CGI in that film yeah. at all. Um, this was before CGI. And when you look at what they did with those effects you can't believe that it's all done with miniatures and models and i mean it still plays you know the effects just play beautifully you know today that was what i was always amazed at is it didn't look like if you look back then you can really look and say okay well that was small that was kind of fake that Mm -hmm. camera angle caught it but that one you really could never tell yeah yeah well the guy who did the effects for that uh did the effects for um 2001 a space odyssey and uh, he also did the effects for star trek the motion picture um, and I got to talk to him too. Actually, he was a really neat, uh, neat, neat guy. But uh, there's uh, there's some history I mean, behind the people that made that movie. There there were some really amazing, you know, artists and writers and, and, and talent. You know, and, and it's I think it's really Scott's best film. The the 2001 Space Odyssey. I made the mistake is trying to watch that as like a 14 year old. Yeah. And I'm like, I was used to watching. I you know my father introduced me to Star Trek, so right. we would watch that. And then Star Wars came along, and I'm expecting you know that something like that and i was way too young because i had no idea what i was watching i went back and watched it as i was older uh but it obviously you see it from a different perspective yeah it's a brilliant film and you know it's a real science fiction film you know there's a difference between science fiction and fantasy science fiction has to be based in some way in some kind of plausible you know science or possibility um you don't just make it up you know as you go along and you know, when you see the films in, 2000, in, in 2001, when you see the ships docking with the station, it takes three or four minutes, you know, and it's very slow. Yeah. And in George Lucas's world, they just whoop in and land and, you know, it's all over with. But that's not the way it works, you know, in space. And, and they acknowledge the science of it. And that's another handmade film. You know, the, 
Stanley Kubrick, those sets were all built. Uh, that wheel that turns, the gravity mm -hmm. scene where he's walking, you know, upside down, they really did that, you know. Um, so, you know, they were very conscious of what it would really be like, you know, in space when they made that movie. It's funny because I went and then they made the sort of second one, which was like 2010 yeah. with Roy Sch and that was more of a mainstream movie. And I right. enjoyed it for what it was, right. and I did it, enjoy it. But it was, at first, I'm like, is this going to be the same thing again? But again, I was young when I saw it. But now, it's funny, we're past 2010, and we're nowhere near... <laughs> <laughs> well, Any of those? Well, in some respects we are, in other respects no. If you read the novel, you know he attributes that to the Vietnam War. Um, you know, in the introduction to 2001: A Space Odyssey, Arthur C. Clarke says, uh, because of you know the money <clears throat> that we put in, in the uh, you know industry that we put into the war, 2001 will not happen in 2001. Now, I, you know, I don't know if that's a good argument or not, but it's something to think about, right? That we divert our energy and our money into sometimes you know things that we shouldn't even be involved in in retrospect and i think the history kind of proves that but um where we could be putting it in in a more positive direction you know we could bring that future a little bit closer um but he he felt that you know he was you know he's a product of the generation you know but he he blamed a, a lot of that uh, on, on vietnam well, this hour has flown by, and we know that you guys have to get back for class tomorrow night, Astronomy Night at the Peak at Central Arizona College down at the Signal Peak Campus. It starts at 6 o'clock sharp. Uh, if it's, you know, if 8470 North Overfield Road is the address, that's 8470 North Overfield Road and Coolidge. We're located between Coolidge and Casa Grande, just east of the I-10. If you get off at the McCartney Road exit, you can find us pretty easily. Um, from 5 to 6, you can get dinner if you'd like. It's uh, six fifty plus tax. The buffet, all you can eat. You can bring the kids and enjoy uh, an evening out. At 6 o'clock, you can come. All the events are free. And it's going to be a fantastic night. Everything will start on the half hour at 6 o'clock. It'll go till 9 o'clock. And uh, everybody will be able to enjoy a lot of different events. Keith, I know you got to go. You got a class. Uh, we're looking forward to having you and all those. Uh, all I'm looking forward to seeing all the props okay. tomorrow night. Leslie, we're looking forward to Alberto and what your group has. And uh, you know, just want to make sh I acknowledge the science division and uh, Diane Beecroft. They do an outstanding job, and they're really excited about tomorrow night again. Astronomy night at the peak at Central Arizona College. You can check it out on the website at centralaz.edu. For Keith and Leslie, and for Joe Carrero, I'm Tom DeCamp. Mello Joe, for the next two weeks, you're going to be in Costa Rica. I will. And we'll be just doing the best of. <laughs> the best of. And then we'll re return on Thursday, May 2nd. Is Correct. Right? I believe Thursday, so. Thursday, May 2nd. And uh, we actually have CAC Live booked into August. Awesome. So we have a lot of guests, and we're going to have a lot of fun over the next couple months. So for Keith and Leslie and for Joe Carrero, I'm Tom DiCamello. Thanks a lot for listening to CAC Live on KQCK in the Santan Valley. Are you ready to start taking control of your future and maximize your earning potential? Central Arizona College has smaller class sizes and personalized attention to help you compete in today's tough job market. CAC now serves Santan Valley and Queen Creek. The CAC Santan Center is located in the shops at Copper Basin on Hunt Highway behind Borrows Pizza. Stop in and see how taking classes at CAC costs a fraction of a state university and your credits can transfer. So if you want to earn real money, you need to learn real skills at Central Arizona College. Enroll in classes today by calling 480-677-7825 or visit www.centralaz.edu or call 480-677-7825 or visit www.centralaz.edu. Central Arizona College, your college, your way.